This is the end of the road for one of Britain's most famous and desirable birds. Ah, grouse. On this day, the so-called glorious 12th of August, the grouse season begins. In a flurry of media attention and razzmatazz, the grouse are whisked away from the moors, perhaps by helicopter, motorbike, even by Gurkha troop, to the kitchens of upmarket hotels and restaurants the length and breadth of Britain, where those who can afford it will enjoy grouse prepared in the traditional manner. Just one manifestation, albeit a very visible one, of an obsession which has lasted for hundreds of years. Which is really tourist orientated in a place like <laughs> It's not just the restaurateurs and their customers who depend on the appearance of the grouse on the 12th. On these muscular legs and stubby wings rests the future of the whole multi-million pound grouse industry. That's right. Thank you very much. So, I mean, I was well rested. Thank you very much. But now I feel like having another holiday. What makes the grouse so special? How did it become the object of such veneration? Some of the reasons for the irresistible attraction of the grouse can only be found by going up to the moors and following a day's grouse shooting. Morning, men. Morning. Morning. The whole complicated procedure is organized and controlled by the head keeper. After rising at 5.30, Alan Edwards has already been up on the moors checking the weather conditions, particularly the wind, to calculate the best way of deploying his team of up to 40 people who will be responsible for driving the grouse over the guns. Each person, some old hands, others out for the first time, has a well-defined job to do. The loaders, the flankers, the beaters, the pickers-up and the drivers all need to know exactly where they're going and what's going on. We're going to do how wall first, Dennis. So you'll have to let all of Chris's side off and half of my side off at the first grid. Yeah, and then the rest of us, where you let us off the last time at the bottom of that yeah, yeah. track. The six drives Alan has scheduled for today require almost military organisation. Chris! if his troops can be prized from their beds at this early hour. So we'll get him in a minute. All right, so you all know what you're doing. Does everybody know what they're doing? You wait, Jim. But none of this would be happening today at all without the advent of the age of steam. The steam engine played a key role in the grouse phenomenon. Although the dates of the grouse shooting season had been laid down by an act of parliament way back in 1773, getting up to the grouse moors with all the goods and chattels was no easy matter. The first stagecoach from London to Edinburgh took three weeks to make the trip. Even in the heyday of coaching, the journey still took 43 hours and needed 112 horses. But by 1888, the whole journey could be made by rail in a mere eight hours. The romantic movement of the time gave the affair even greater appeal. Escaping the squalors of the city for the wild highlands was very much in keeping with the romantic ideal of the time. Sir? Good hunting, sir. Thank you, Travis. As contemporary accounts make clear, the grouse moors had already become a place of escape for the wealthy city dweller. You are tired. The day's business has been heavy and anxious. But pretty soon your spirits start to rise as you rush along at a terrific pace, full 45 miles an hour, flying past the great oaks and elms of old England, north to the moors, where the master of the highlands King of the game birds awaits your coming.
The grouse remains such a potent symbol that sportsmen now come from around the world to Britain's heather moorland, which is still, despite repeated attempts at introduction elsewhere, the only place the red grouse can be found. The guns on this shoot have also, like our 19th century traveller, taken eight hours to get here, but they've flown from America. Okay, Dan, let's go at it. I've got one. Dan Searle's got what? I've got number seven. Traditionally, they must first draw lots for positions in the line of guns. The central ones are the most favoured. The host at number, number oh, eight. Oh, yeah. I love it. Number <laughs> three. <laughs> well, okay, yeah, okay, if you're going to walk, set off. Right. You must be wealthy to shoot grouse. Each gun on a top grouse moor must expect to pay about £2,000 for a single day's sport. Oh, I love the cake. They are really something. Oh, wow. Isn't that nice? I can tell, yeah. It makes you see the birds better. It doesn't make you hit them any better. Doesn't it have claws here? No, unfortunately, it doesn't. Look those glasses that Stanton has. They're incredible. Yeah, they're yellow. Well, they're lavender yellow. Today, the moors are at their most picturesque. Six months ago, things were rather different. There's one key difference between the grouse and other game birds. It cannot simply be bred in captivity and then released. Artificially reared birds never adapt to the rigours of the moor. So the grouse is a truly wild bird and can only be managed in the wild. It's exceptionally tough, being one of the very small group of animals which stay up on the moors all through the winter. The grouse earns the admiration of the keeper. The grouse is so special because it lives in such a wild environment. It has to endure such an awful lot that other game birds don't have to endure. The winter's here. It's such a marvel that a grouse lives through the winter, arrives at the spring, breeds so successfully, as if the winter hasn't happened. Even if the snow starts to drift, the grouse can tunnel right down into it as deep as two or three feet sometimes to get at the heather shoots below. If the moor freezes solid, the grouse are ingenious enough to follow the sheep around, using them as woolly icebreakers. As soon as the snow melts and the heather underneath begins to dry, the ice gives way to fire. My aim when I set off to burn the moor is not just to, to burn it in a, in a great huge one fire and the whole place is gone. You have controlled heather burns, you set fire to small strips you try and keep these strips 30 yards wide. It doesn't matter how long they go, but as long as they don't get any wider than 30, 40 yards at the very most. The grouse won't stray more than 15 yards from the heather cover at the sides of a burnt strip, so an uncontrolled burn creates a wasted no man's land. The depth of the burn is important too. If the heather's too wet, only the tips burn. If it's too dry, the fire will get into the peat below and kill the plants outright. There aren't many times when conditions are exactly right, and Alan must take advantage of them whenever they occur, even if it means working well into the night. Proper heather management is you know exactly when to burn at the right time, and hopefully Within six months to one year, you have a green mat of young heather shoots growing all over it again. The grouse, its whole life revolves around the heather. It needs heather that's young enough for it to be able to feed on successfully because young heather is more nutritious. It needs middle-aged heather to breed in and, and live in, and it needs 
old, mature, long heather so that the tips stick through the snow in the bad weather so that it can feed it through the winter. The curlew is one of a large group of birds that benefit directly from this work, nesting in the heather each year. While much of the wildlife the grouse moor supports is welcomed by the keeper, some is not. The dog to me is very important. It is a major tool in the gamekeeper's work. We have uh, personally keep several different breeds of dogs for de several different reasons. They're a companion to me in a very lonely life at times. They are a great working companion on a shoot day or when you use them in predator control. They earn their keep every penny of it, a good working dog. I think the number one predator on a grouse moor, the worst predator on a grouse moor, is the fox. Get him, get him, get him, skid him, seek him, seek him. The terrier has been sent into the fox's earth to spring him. If Alan should miss the fox, the lurcher will outpace and kill it for him. Good dog. Sometimes they'll fight to the death underground. Not at home. Alan has strong feelings about the fox. I love them. I absolutely love them. I think they're the most fascinating animal you could ever wish to find. I don't personally hate the fox. And I know in controlling the foxes, I benefit so much of the wildlife that I feel that to destroy a fox is perfectly justifiable in my mind by the other benefits. But I wouldn't like to see the last fox killed. I just would like to see them at a, at a level that is controlled so that other wildlife can survive and thrive on a moor. Another unwelcome denizen of the moors, as far as the grouse are concerned, is the diminutive weasel, which compensates for its size by its ferocity and will easily take an adult grouse. Inevitably, the grouse moors attract birds of prey, like the magnificent peregrine falcon, which feeds directly on the grouse. It's protected by the law, and after years of persecution, it now coexists in an uneasy truce with the keeper. Using what looks like a large wire lobster pot, complete with funnel neck, Alan creates a trap for another destructive predator. During the nesting season, crows can be devastating, cutting a swathe through eggs and chicks. Alan has made the trap near trees, which he knows are attractive to crows looking for somewhere to nest. A bait crow sets the trap. Crows wanting to build here will not tolerate any competition. They get into the trap and kill the bait crow, becoming in turn bait themselves. We spend many long hours at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day sitting in wait listening for other birds to give the sign away of where a fox is or where it's working. He can then get into a position on that moor, either before it's daylight or just before it goes dark, and lay and wait for it. Once we've spotted the fox, 
and then we use high-powered rifles to shoot and kill it. The sportsmen probably have little idea of the long, lonely hours the keeper must put in on behalf of the grouse. Back on the chute, the whole party is making its way down to its positions. By now, Alan and his team of beaters and flankers will be perhaps a mile and a half away from the line of guns. The waiting begins. Although the steam engine had made it possible to get to the moors, it didn't necessarily make it desirable, but a succession of English kings with a passion for shooting soon set the tone. Royal patronage made a trip to the Grouse Moors part of the social scene. Ascot in June, Henley in July, and in August, the express train north for the glorious 12th. <laughs> shooting fast-moving, low-flying grouse is potentially the most dangerous sort of shooting there is. And as more and more sportsmen took to the moors, some a good deal less experienced than others, the physical dangers increased accordingly. You know, when I first came here, I asked Beale if Brockman had ever shot a man. Oh, yes, sir, he whispered. Lord Brockman shoots a man every year. <laughs> Off we go! As grouse became the focus of such attention, another side of their unusual natural history became only too apparent. Not a bird in sight. Quite extraordinary. Drive after drive, we spot a couple of brace at best. Well, old Horseman's one of the best keepers in Scotland. It's a well-known fact. I know, but that's how it was. I say it's disease. Periodically, for no apparent reason, grouse numbers suffer sudden and drastic crashes. Although this unpredictability is part of the grouse's charm, the phenomenon has been the object of intense research for over a hundred years. Yet in many ways, the bird remains an enigma. On some moors, the grouse's own aggression seems to provide the answer. As winter turns to spring, the male grouse defends a territory in which he hopes to induce a female to lay. Border disputes are usually decided by skirmishes and display. However, sometimes things get much more serious. If a moor gets too crowded, aggression may rise to peak levels all over the moor, and after a good drubbing, the weaker grouse set off in a mass exodus, leaving the original moor practically deserted. This may account for some population crashes, but it's not the whole story. As you might expect, when so much is at stake, the very latest technology is used to study the grouse. Dr. Peter Hudson is eavesdropping on the private life of a grouse over three miles away. By fitting birds with radio transmitters of different frequencies, he can pinpoint up to 20 individual birds, follow their progress around the moor, and discover their eventual fate. This is hard physical work, demanding long, unsociable hours and a strong constitution. One of the transmitters is emitting a tone which indicates the bird hasn't moved for a long time.
The bloody neck makes it look as if this one has met its end at the claws of a stoat. This work gives Peter a detailed analysis of the causes of grouse death on the moor. Dogs, particularly pointers, are an essential part of Dr. Hudson's scientific equipment. When he's trying to get an accurate estimate of total numbers of birds in a given area, Peter must rely on the ultra-sensitive nose of the pointer. It's very easy for humans to miss the grouse, but the pointers are galvanized by the faintest whiff. By studying the results, other explanations for the crashes and grouse numbers are emerging. On some moors, sudden increases in the number of predators. Whilst on others, the finger points at a much more elusive cause. The larger predators are an obvious threat, but whole populations of grouse can be devastated by a more sinister, hidden enemy which has taken advantage of the bird's potentially fatal reliance on heather. When conditions are right, entire grouse moors can become biologically booby-trapped by a minute parasitic worm. In wet conditions, the microscopic infective stages swarm all over the heather, writhing about in the water film. The grouse simply cannot avoid picking up these noxious creatures, either directly as they feed, or by collecting them on their feathers as they walk about in the heather, then swallowing them when they preen. Once inside the bird, the worm changes into its adult form and starts to feed in the gut. A low infestation isn't a problem, but once numbers get into the thousands, the grouse begins to weaken. If that happens in the harsh upland winters, the bird is doomed. In spring, the female grouse must build up her body fat both to produce her clutch of eggs and see her through the 22 days it takes to incubate them when she hardly feeds at all. With a heavy worm burden, she'll never make it. What stores of fat she does have are quickly used up, but as she gets weaker and weaker, she doesn't desert the nest. Her maternal instinct is so strong, she'll use her last reserves trying to keep her eggs warm, before dying still on the nest. On a heavily infested moor, vast numbers of grouse will die, causing a crash in the population. Several remedies are being tried, even dosing individual birds. It's an extraordinary amount of care for birds destined to fly over the guns in just a few short months. The nesting females may seem hopelessly vulnerable at first sight, sitting passively in open moorland for 22 days. But it's not quite as bad as it looks. The hen is perfectly camouflaged. If threatened, she can stay absolutely motionless making her almost invisible amongst the surrounding heather. For predators hunting by smell, like the fox, the grouse goes further. She packs her feathers tightly around her body. Like this, she hardly emits a trace of scent. If the source of danger becomes a direct threat, something very strange happens. Her heart rate, normally around 140 beats a minute, tumbles in some cases as low as 20. No one's exactly sure how this helps, but while she's in this catatonic state, a fox can pass within inches and miss her completely. While a new generation of grouse is incubating on the moor, hundreds of miles away in a dingy Victorian factory, Skilled craftsmen are directing their talents towards the grouse's eventual destruction. Handcrafted British guns are revered and coveted around the world. 
It takes around 80 hours to machine, drill and join the barrels. The part of the gun containing the firing pins and other moving parts called the action arrives as a dull, solid forging, which is first precisely machined. But mere machines can't begin to obtain the levels of metal working perfection demanded for this sort of gun. Every metal part is first coated with a microscopic layer of carbon black from an oil flame. The parts are then partially assembled. Any high spots will show up where the carbon black has rubbed off. Minute amounts of metal must then be filed off by hand. This painstaking work will take 230 hours or more. Once the barrels are finished, they're allocated a number against which every detail of the gun's subsequent history will be recorded in the factory's records. Meanwhile, the woodwork takes shape. The blanks of walnut from which the stock will be made cost four to five hundred pounds in the raw state. Only the wood from the base of the tree where it enters the ground can be used. The strength of the trunk is kneaded up by the barrels whereas the swirling patterns created as the roots begin are prized for the stock itself. Such wood is very scarce. The finished woodwork is oiled and hand rubbed with fine pumice powder every day for two to three weeks, depending on the weather. Each gunsmith will use his own secret concoction of oils and additives to bring out the very best features of the wood. Finally, in the finishing shop, the metalwork is engraved. A highly skilled engraver may work on only three or four guns in an entire year. At least 650 hours go into the manufacture of a standard best gun, and even if you paid your £18,000 and ordered one today, you'd still have to wait about two and a half years for it to arrive. Back on the moors, the incubation is nearly over. The hatching of the eggs is timed to coincide with the mass emergence of insects in spring. Insects which will provide the grouse chicks with an extra rich diet for the first few critical weeks of their lives. All the chicks hatch at the same time, prompted, amazingly, by ultrasonic calls from the hen. It's a sobering thought that on this nest alone, these tiny balls of fluff will represent up to 400 pounds worth of shooting revenue once the season begins. With hundreds of nests on a single moor and thousands of moors in Britain, you start to see why grouse shooting is big business. The chicks go out on forays for tasty insects. To start with, they're unable to control their body temperature and must periodically return to their mother to be warmed up again. But now the nest has become a dangerous place to stay. The chicks don't share their mother's skills in outwitting the fox and the falcon. They leave the nest within hours. Their precocious development continues. In just 12 days, the whole of this family will be able to fly if disturbed. As the birds grow up, Alan makes a careful estimate of numbers. He must know at the start of the season how many birds can be shot 
while still leaving sufficient breeding stock for next year. A good keeper keeps a constant finger on the pulse of the moor and knows from week to week how many birds there are and what sort of condition they're in. This year has been particularly good, and as Alan starts the drive, he's hoping the guns will succeed in killing their target quota, as the moors are in danger of becoming overcrowded. As the drive begins, 16 beaters are lined up, eight on either side of Alan in an enormous arc. Six flankers stand along the sides of the arc between the beaters and the guns to turn back any birds that try to break out sideways. Get it out, hot! Get it out! As well as its habitat and its unpredictability, there's one further aspect of the grouse's natural history that's of overriding importance to the shooter, and that's the way it flies. In slow motion, we can see its short, stubby wings and powerful chest. This is a bird designed for explosive flight, short bursts of great speed and exceptional agility, and it usually flies very close to the ground. Now at normal speed, we begin to appreciate what a testing target a driven grouse becomes. As the beaters approach, the tension mounts. Has Alan made the right calculations? Has the wind changed direction? If they do come, where will they come from? Look up, look up, look up. At the height of the drive, the birds are coming over so fast that the loaders are working flat out to keep the guns supplied. Shooting like this would have been impossible with earlier gun designs. The pressure for better guns came first from disgruntled duelists, fed up with the inaccuracy and slowness of their weapons. For the sportsmen of the period, a good pointer dog was the first requirement. The pointer would find the game and stand rigidly on point beside it, allowing the sportsman to walk up and shoot it on the ground with his flintlock. Shooting a bird on the wing was considered exceptional. Pointing the gun upwards and firing was likely to deposit flaming gunpowder from the igniting pan directly down your sleeve. In 1820, the percussion cap gun arrived. Although this was still a muzzle loader, it had a tremendous advantage at the other end of the barrel. The charge was set off not by a vulnerable pan of loose powder, but by a small copper detonator. 
The gun could now be fired reliably at a flying bird. There was a dramatic change with the invention of the pinfire cartridge. Gunpowder and shot combined in one convenient disposable package. No more time-consuming muzzle loading. But the pinfire cartridge had flaws. The protruding detonating pin which gave it its name was vulnerable and easily snapped off. By moving the detonator to the middle, these problems were solved, resulting in the modern centre fire cartridge. Finally, the outside hammers were lost, and in a 50-year burst of inventiveness, the present-day shotgun had arrived. Much to the disadvantage of the Krauss. Alan's horn signals the end of the drive and tells the guns to stop firing. As he and the beaters go off to the start of the next drive, the loaders and pickers-up get on with collecting the fallen. A retriever is essential for this job. Even in death, the marvellous camouflage of the grouse can make them very hard to find without the help of a good dog. About 60 grouse have been killed on this drive. It may sound a lot, but it's actually a fairly modest total compared with a hundred years ago when Lord Walsingham was able to shoot 1,070 birds in a single day. What about the ones behind have they been? Right out, wouldn't it, in that ditch? Yeah. Did you get that? I've been there, you're just going out, out from there. Well, I think we did all right, Jim. I'm quite happy with that. Yeah. At lunchtime, the, the head keeper's priority job is to his birds. He must look after the birds before anything. The birds must be laid out to cool, so that they're not sweating and getting in a bad condition. He must look after them when they're dead as much as he looks after them when they're alive. The beaters all must be seen to, the, the lunches must be in the right place at the right time. They all get a can of beer which must be supplied. Everybody must be seen to and be made happy at lunchtime. The gun's luncheon party is an important feature of a day's grouse shooting. They used to be considerably more elaborate affairs, with even the occasional string quartet in attendance. The one thing that hasn't changed over the years is the topic of conversation. It was on a moor near Nairn, very windy day, birds coming with the wind. I shot a high one right in front of me and without waiting to see the result, turned half around and aimed at another which I missed. Almost as I pressed the trigger, I received a most frightful blow on the side of my face which barely knocked me over in the butts. My loader pulled me to my feet and I realized the bird I had shot at first, falling through the air at the rate of an express train had struck me as it fell. Very dazed and a little angry, I said to my loader, Didn't you see that bird coming, my man? Yes, my lord, the fellow says. I did see it coming. So I hid behind your lordship. Oh, <laughs> really, Edward? Pass the torch, Charles. Oh, oh, yeah. Then, as now, conversation would turn to the other wildlife that had been seen on the moor that morning. The appearance of a hen harrier or a peregrine falcon could ruin a day's sport, scattering the grouse and making them impossible to drive. The grouse have a rough time of it at the hands of the hawk, that's for sure. But Donald Ross told me he once saw a cock grouse keep a hawk at bay that was trying to seize his young. The hen gathered her chicks under her and squatted in the header, whilst the cock dodged backwards and forwards beneath the hawk. This went on for some five minutes until at last the hawk beat a retreat. Marvellous plucky bird, the grouse.
falcons may give the keeper nightmares, but for some sportsmen, they're a way of life. The falconer considers grouse his ultimate quarry. It's so tough and strong in its flight that it must be hunted with the fastest bird of prey Britain has to offer, the peregrine falcon. This is a sport only for the very patient. You can't force the peregrine to do anything. You can only encourage it to do what you want in its own way. Once the birds are taken out in the morning, they must first be offered a bath. In the wild, they would bathe every day to keep the feathers in prime condition and to control parasites. Also, they seem to enjoy it. the bath, the feathers must dry out completely. Sometime in the morning, the peregrine must cast, bringing up a pellet of indigestible bone and feather from yesterday's prey. Once these requirements are seen to, it's well after lunch by the time the falconer actually gets up to the moor. The first step is to find your grouse. Once again, the pointer is essential. The dog will quarter the moor until it finds a bird. Struck rigid by the smell of the grouse, the pointer stops dead. When this happens, there is absolutely no rush. The grouse will freeze at the threat of the dog, and the dog will freeze at the smell of the grouse. They can remain like this for half an hour or more. The falcon is held aloft while it composes itself, shakes its feathers into place, and checks the wind. Eventually, it glides off. Sometimes it'll fly to the nearest post and take no further interest in the proceedings, but the falconer hopes that with a little encouragement, it'll start to climb. Dog and grouse remain locked together. Finally, when the peregrine has gained enough height, say 500 to 1,000 feet, the falconer will break the spell. The pleasure of grouse hawking is to engineer and then to marvel at that magnificent stoop. There are few chances. Even on a good day after three, possibly four stoops, the falcon becomes bored and it's time to go home. The peregrine does not always kill. An experienced grouse can avoid the 120 mile an hour stoop by jinking at the very last moment or by quickly dropping back into the heather where it will be safe. So a single kill in a day will be reward enough for the falconer. Not so the shooting party, where the bag is still a measure of the success of the day. At the end of the day, the birds are laid out to cool and to be ritually counted by the head keeper, not singly, but in pairs or brace, as tradition demands. Well, get some nice young birds to eat, will you? Oh, the birds were shot two weeks ago. They've been hanging. It's a worrying time for the keeper. 
It is a bit nerve-wracking, but I think that my own personal view on it is providing people have enjoyed themselves and have felt that they've got as much out of the day as possible, the bag particularly doesn't really count. Although, yes, when people sit back in years to come, they certainly do reflect on how many birds were shot. That isn't a priority. If the moor is healthy, is doing well, everybody felt that they saw a good number of birds for the moor. I think the bag doesn't come into it. People are happy. And to me, that is the main priority. 138. That's a record for drives. Well done. You're getting too good, you guns. We'll have to ban you from coming. <laughs> This, then, is the paradox of the grouse. Whatever the morality of killing for pleasure, it's the money the sportsmen have paid to indulge their passion for grouse that keeps the moors going. An uneconomic moor would soon be dug up and turned over to forestry. The grouse would disappear. So the money not only ensures thousands of jobs, but also safeguards the future of these wild heather uplands for all the wildlife living here. In a couple of months, as the weather turns once more, the less hardy bird species will leave the moors. Grouse and keeper will be left to see the winter out together. Ancient antagonists, but joint guardians of the future of the moors. <laughs>